Good morning. Welcome back to Risk Learning Collective web series. I'm excited to have Megan Torrance this morning, and I'm going to introduce you guys to her here shortly, even though Megan is a name that probably does not need into any introduction in our industry. I hope you were able to catch the sessions we had yesterday. If you were not able to catch it, they are still available on our Facebook page and will remain so for easy and open access to anyone who wants to continue to enrich their professional development during this time. As I've mentioned before, we will all get this together, get through this together. Uh, I am Ann Wynn, Marketing Specialist with Risk Inc. And as I mentioned today, I've got Megan Torrance starting off our lineup this morning. Good morning, Duncan. He's already popped in to say hello. Of course. I am going to read a brief introduction of Megan. As I mentioned, who probably really doesn't need an introduction, but I love this intro. Megan Torrance is the CEO, Chief Energy Officer of Torrance Learning an e-learning design and development firm with an intentionally random client base. Megan brings over a decade of business consulting and project management experience to her instructional design and development work. The Torrance Learning Team combines creativity with pragmatism and fun with focus. E-learning guru by day and ice hockey goaltender by night, Megan is devoted to not only delivering outstanding work to clients, but also creating a top-notch work environment based on trust, flexibility, compassion, and fun. Torrance Learning is based outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So Megan, I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about this intentionally random client base. So please share. <laughs> sure thing. When we started out in business, um, uh, we you know, got clients wherever we could and every business guru I talked to and consultant said, you need to focus on a vertical, you need to find an industry that makes sense. Um, and I kind of, I don't know, I brustled against that. What I realized ultimately is that by working with a wide variety of industries, um, we're able to do a couple of things, right? So we learn what works in one, we can apply things in different different spaces that we might not have occurred. Yeah. But we also, because we're, we're often working on really strategic projects for our clients, this way we're not competing with, you know, we're not working for competing clients. So every once in a while it happens um, and we have um, we both, we, we won't take a competitive client without checking in with an existing one uh, sure, that makes first. Sense. And then we've just built firewalls on the team to make that uh, as secure as, as possible. Uh, but it, uh, it, it was kind of something that started early and then has really, really um, uh, stuck with us. No, that absolutely makes sense. And I'm sure that that makes your clients feel much better about working with you and knowing that there aren't competitors and possibly a breach of data and things like that. And so that falls into line with what you were saying about, um, you know, being ethical and having that great work mm -hmm. environment. So absolutely admirable. And um, I think that's probably why your clients or one of the reasons why your clients love you so much, as do the rest of oh. it. <laughs> So, uh, well, without delay, I'm going to go ahead and have you get started on your session this morning. It's XAPI, What You Need to Know. This session is really focused for the learning practitioners who um, want to get started with XAPI, but aren't really sure where to start or how to start. And this is a great foundation for those of us who are not pop, probably as technical um, and so it's a great introduction for those who want to get started. And without further ado, I'm going to bring up your session. Here we go. There we go. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thanks for putting me in the Learning Collective. I think that this is a really awesome opportunity um, to, to bring people together. And man, you guys pivoted fast and were able to, to bring bring a program together that helps us develop ourselves. Um, I'm really, uh, I, one of the things I'm seeing lately is that, you know, in, in learning and development, we've always been told that we need to do more with less. Um, now it's more with less, faster, and under stress, right? And so um, the, the best way to do that is by being effective with what we do. So um, sharpening our own saw there to uh, borrow a Stephen Coveyism from about 30 years ago. 
So uh, as Anne said, um, Torrance Learning is a, a custom learning design and development and strategy firm. And we spend a lot of time um, on professional development for our peers in the industry to, to raise the bar for all of us. Uh, so we spend a lot of time on agile project management for instructional designers, uh, but then what we're here for today, really around XAPI and getting better data from the learning that we do. So uh, I hope that uh, this is, is useful for you as you go. And certainly if there are questions from the live audience, uh, feel free to chime in. So at this point, you may be wondering, what is XAPI? Um, X API, well, X stands for experience and API stands for application programming interface, which is really an agreement between two computer systems on how they're going to share data. And so, Anne, when you uh, post in LinkedIn and you click this, the, the little button that says send to Twitter also, uh, that happens, that magic happens uh, because of an API. Uh, you may have heard of it as the Experience API, which is its formal and grown-up name, and, uh, and, and the X for Experience means this is so much more than just learning, right? This is performance data as well, which is really, really important. And the project that got it all started is the Tin Can project. So you may see it referred to as the Tin Can API. Um, and uh, so that's a, an older term, right? But what is it? It's really a specification for how we're going to send, store, and retrieve activity about learning uh, and about performance. And uh, it comes to us from the same folks who brought us SCORM, so the Advanced Distributed Learning Group out of the US federal government. And um, some people have said, well, gosh, is this the next generation of SCORM? And I'd like to challenge that thinking a little bit, right? So, because um, next generation doesn't really capture it at all. So my guess is either you are watching this on a phone right now or within an arm's reach, you have a device that looks like this, right? So let me tell a little story. Uh, I'm old enough and I'm gonna date myself. I'm old enough that when I grew up, there was a box in my kitchen the big long 16 foot cord on it. And if I wanted to talk to a friend, one friend at a time, um, I could uh, pick up the, the handset on that box and call my friend. And as long as my friend was on their phone at exactly the same time connected to their wall, we could talk to each other. Couldn't send pictures, we couldn't play games, but we could talk to each other, right? And that's how I think of SCORM. Right? And, and in fact, I grew up out in the countryside and so, and I predate answering machines. And so the, um, we had our phone turned up way loud because we might be out in the horse barn or way back in the backyard. And when the phone rang, we all you know, would drop everything and yell, phone! And then sprint like crazy to catch that call before the person on the other side hung up. And I want you to think of, next time you go in your learning management system and you're about to take a course and you click the take course button, when you click take course, that means your, your e-learning and your LMS yelling phone at each other, okay? Now, the phone that is next to you, okay, does telephone calls. It takes pictures, it takes video, it counts your steps, you can read the news, you can play games on it. Right? Mine is a Samsung, and this actually has a remarkably accurate pulse oximeter. So my phone will tell you my blood oxygen content, okay? My phone will do things that were invented after it was manufactured. So think of the power, the multiple media, the not just one stream of data, not just connected. Like if I go out into the boondocks and I, I or, I, or, or I'm on a plane, I turn on Wi-Fi or airplane mode, I, I can still do some things on my phone, okay? which I can't take a SCORM course if I don't have an internet connection. Okay? And so what I want you to think of XAPI is not so much next generation SCORM is what will replace SCORM. Okay? And that's a good thing. SCORM is not an all bad uh, proposition for us. SCORM has been useful, but think about it this way. It keeps track of about 16 different things between your LMS and your e-learning courses, only your e-learning courses, okay? Um, and, but in that pile of 16 or 20 things that the LMS and the e-learning courses use in SCORM, only about five of which are useful to us as instructional designers. And every single SCORM package from a technology perspective looks exactly the same. 
Um, I, I, I've, I've had all sorts of telemarketers or you know email marketers ask me to help me with my logistics problems. My logistics, I send people a zip file. There's no logistics involved in that. Right? It's email. Right? And so um, those little zip files uh, work. And the nice thing is that SCORM is interoperable. It's interchangeable. You don't need a geek to do SCORM. Right? We have these fabulous authoring packages that let us focus on the instruction and the media and the design. And we don't have to worry about the technology because it just works. And these tools are so cheap, the barriers to entry are very, very low. SCORM is why. Right? This, this shared industry-wide global specification is why the, the, the digital training, the e-learning environment has exploded and become such a rich and interoperable and fragmented marketplace, which is really good for buyers. Really good for buyers. You can um, accept SCORM packages, right? You can buy training from mom and pop shops, person sitting in their kitchen. Well, we're all sitting in the kitchen right now for e-learning developers, right? Um, right? Person sitting at home in an office uh, to great big companies that do this. Um, you can swatch, swap authoring platforms. You can use Storyline. You can use Captivate. You can use Domino. You can use um, all sorts of other packages. And uh, you can then ditch your LMS and get a new one, and all your old course content still works. This is really good for the industry, but it's also limiting because I have this limited vocabulary of things I can actually talk about right? and only for e-learning. In contrast, right? in contrast, XAPI is a grammar. And when I have grammar, I can talk about anything. Right? And so I like to think of, this is my second big metaphor, right? So I had the phone metaphor, here's my second big metaphor. I like to think of XAPI as like the Lego store. So I can go into the Lego store and buy the Death Star kit, take it home and build it. Great. I can go into the Lego store, I can buy the Death Star kit and the Black Panther uh, attack ships and the women scientists, uh, little people, and the police cars, and I can put them all together and make my own personalized experience. I can add the robotics, right, the Lego robotics. I can go to the library. I can check out a 3D printer from the library, and I can print my own bricks, or I can buy bricks manufactured by third parties, and they all work together because they all agree to this grammar, right, of bumps and grooves on the, on the basic Lego brick. That's how they all stick together. And as long as we as an industry all agree on this grammar, we can assemble remarkably customized, unique to our own business situation, learning experiences because it all follows the same grammar. So let's talk a little bit about vocabulary that you'll need to get started with XAPI. Um, and I just, I will start for all my folks in the safety training or in the sciences um, by telling you just how much I love stock imagery um, and uh, the, the seriousness of this guy uh, and absolute utter lack of PPE as he is doing this close up work with chemicals, which of course we all know uh, that chemicals are all, you know, beautiful, perfect uh, red colors like this, right? Um, gotta love that stock art. So here's here's the um, here's here's a, a few vocabulary words, and this guy is is, is how we're going to learn about that, right? So there you are doing your job, um, and you have your content, whatever it is, and you have a learning record provider. A learning record provider, this little pipette, is what is sending the data. And so in an e-learning and a SCORM context, your e-learning course sends SCORM data, right? That is a learning record provider. In an XAPI context, the learning record provider could be an e-learning course. It could be a video. It could be a... Um, uh, a checklist, an observation list. Uh, it could be your actual systems of work where, where the work that you do is stored, logistic systems, sales systems, um, those kinds of things. Um, 
anything, any place that you learn, it can be micro learning, it can be adaptive learning, it can be, um, uh, does somebody click on and, and how do they use performance support or infographics or anything you can digitize can become a learning record provider. And it's gonna use that pipette, right? Rather than just flinging data everywhere, right? It's gonna use that pipette to structure that data into activity statements. And we use profiles, think of profiles as kind of like the dictionaries or a language dictionary um, around uh, your activity statements, which are those sentences that use the grammar. And so this guy is gonna be drip, 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 data, 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 right? XAPI is stored as series of transactions in its base form. And so these statements are gonna go dripping as they go into the learning record store, which is the database that houses the XAPI statements. It is specifically designed to do this. And so people sometimes say, well, do I need to get a learning record store if I wanna use XAPI? Well, only if you want to catch your data, which is kind of the point, right? So you need to send XAPI data properly formatted and you need a learning record store, a database, a piece of software to receive that. Okay? And then you've got a bunch of other data you're also going to have to keep track of, right? Um, so the, the and, and that's where the fun starts. Now. This is so far analogous to a SCORM world as long as we're just looking at e-learning. But remember that learning record provider could be anything. But I'm gonna go one step further on you, okay? The, that pipette can reach into that beaker, right? And pull out data, which we can't very often easily do in an e-learning world today, right? Um, and so when I reach out in and pull out data and suck that out of the LRS with my pipette, right, and it works because it's in that activity statement, so I, I, can, I know how to read those sentences, I can use data that already exists in the learning record store to then personalize and customize my learning experience. So if I already have a bunch of transactions in the learning record store that demonstrate not only what other courses I've taken and how I performed on them, but what I'm doing in the real world on my work, then that learning experience can be tailored to me. And that is one of the most amazing and powerful things that we have with XAPI. Now, XAPI statements, then, right? These are sentences, and these are some prototypical sentences around XAPI. Um, and I'm gonna pause here for a second and give you a chance as you're listening to this, it's only gonna be about 10 seconds, to take a look at these and see what you notice about these prototypical XAPI statements. Okay, 10 seconds. Okay. So each one of them is identified right, with an actor. I know who sent that data in. Okay. Um, I know what they did to what. Okay. And not all of this is learning, right? So actually practicing Frosty Birthday Cake. That's a learning, but it's a, not, it's a less formal, right? Bob performed landing. We have a result, right? We have successfully or five stars or a score of 98. And then we have some additional context information. It gives me more color, more decoration about what happened, right? I know, were you with a particular instructor? Were you in a particular simulation suite? Were you on a particular piece of equipment? What text-based information did you add? Now, all of this, if properly formatted, this context can then be used to pull out different right, vectors of the data. I would like to know all of the things that instructor Tim has been up to and how his students are performing. I would like to be able to provide, you know, do some semantic analysis and some AI on all of the text comments entered on a course. I have lots and lots of things that I can pull out here. Right? The fact that these sentences are, some of them are short, some of them are long, some of them have extra data, some of them don't, 
This is what makes it hard for a traditional learning management system that's used to very orderly and almost rectangular shaped data, right? This is what makes it hard for a traditional learning management system to process all this data. Reporting is really the killer app um, when it comes to XAPI because being able to get into interesting data, pull it out and do something with it uh, is where it's all at. Okay? So what can I do with this data? Right? It's one thing to have all this data, but what can I do with this data? So again, I'm gonna pause for just about five seconds and let you take a look at this list and, and, and there's going to be something on this list that you're going to get jazzed about. So there's so much more that we can do with data um, that as instructional designers in most organizations, we haven't had the opportunity to do with our traditional data sets. Right? So remember, SCORM's not bad, but it doesn't give us all that we need. Right? Think about this list, right? And then I want you to think about marketing. You know what, when I was in college 25 years ago, marketing was kind of a black art. It was full of like nuance and we were looking for subliminal pictures in, you know, glasses of bourbon, right? And, and, and we had this, the, the, it was very little data associated with it. And then go find a marketer today and ask them how they do what they do, how they measure what works. After you have that conversation, it'll take about a half an hour for them to download all the things that they can do with data and how that informs their marketing right now. And data marketing is an incredibly data-driven environment, right? It's no longer a dark art, okay? And then go ask the next instructional designer you find online from six feet away, right? And ask them what they do with data. And it's not the same, right? So here's the thing, though. It would be utter malpractice if I didn't share with you this. Right? You can do all of this without XAPI. You've been able to do all of this without XAPI for the last 10 or 15 years using straight up old web technologies. When that happens, what people are doing is they're building a beautiful piece of software that is a black box with its own data model that you can't hook into. It's not shareable. It's hard to leave. They want you to. They, they want it to be hard for you to leave them. Okay? Their day, your data is locked up, and it doesn't look like any other data. It would be like trying to take Lego and the um, oh shoot, what are the the the, the spokes and the wheels and the metal straps and connectors, right? Those two is it connects something like that. Anyways, those two systems don't work together. Right? So you either buy one or you buy the other, or you have one great big mess that doesn't actually work. Okay? So all of this is technically feasible. The magic of XAPI is not the technology. The technology is actually the easy part. The magic of XAPI is the agreement of an entire industry to come together around how we're going to talk about learning and performance experiences, just the way we did with SCORM 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Right? But we're doing it now with a much richer data set. And it'll take time. It'll take time. Um, and, and having been around, not from the earliest of days of XAPI, but certainly from the pretty early days of XAPI, um, I'll be honest, it's frustrating sometimes to see that it's slow. Right? Um, my team's using XAPI. For, I mean, it's kind of our default. It's our, our, our utilitarian go-to for all sorts of interesting things. Right? Uh, but last summer, I had the opportunity to work with the eLearning Guild to write the state of XAPI adoption. And um, what was really interesting, well, I'll tell you, right, <laughs> what was really frustrating was the short size of these little blue bars. Right? And, and we're all looking at curves these, these days, but um, this is a, a typical technology adoption curve. You have some early adopters. Right, some very early adopters, those are in blue. And then you have a very, very tall wave coming, right? 46%, 46, 47, somewhere in there. 46 or 47% of the people who responded to our survey last summer are interested but not yet using XAPI. And a full 20%, a little bit more, aren't aware of it yet. So it's been out for seven years, it'd been out for six years when we did the study, um, but it 
is still coming and yet that huge wave right is 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 happening and above that big wave of 45 percent 66 percent of them say they will implement it within the next one to three years so if you are in the learning technology space and you're not looking about looking at this in the next one to three years you will be behind yeah. if you are a software vendor who has invested deeply in xapi and have been questioning your commitment to that i will tell you that wave is coming and it's really really exciting so let's talk about, so we don't get left behind, let's talk about what it takes to get started, right? First, you've got to send your data. Yes, I know, first you need a plan. Great, you've made a plan, now you need to send data, right? So there are five basic ways to send your data. One is to use your e-learning authoring tools, tools you already own, right? Um, if you've listened this far into the presentation, you're either my parents or, Right, <laughs> you, you're in the e-learning world, right? You have authoring tools. Most of them send some sort of XAPI data. We're gonna talk about that in just a bit, right? You can get your favorite product vendor to send the data, right? If you've got a really cool performance support tool, mobile checklist, reminder tool, whatever, mentoring tool, um, whatever you've got, call up the vendor and say, hey, can you send your data as XAPI so I can put your data along with all my other learning program data so I don't have these stupid silos, right? These, these, these dysfunctional silos of data just even within the learning and development space. Um, and this works, right? Uh, there's a guy actually at Halliburton who called up two, two product vendors and said, hey, I love your product, I use it for my training, um, but I really would like you to send the data as XAPI. And you know what? Thank you, because now Survey Gizmo and Kaltura both send XAPI data. Um, you can use an aggregator to assemble things that don't track their data as XAPI into something that does. So Zappy Apps allows you to make this awesome branched pathway. It's a fabulous mobile tool. You can use it online too, um, but it's great for people who don't have a desk, right? Deskless workers. Um, and, um, and so it's this great learning experience. Behind the hood, you don't even need to know this, but behind the hood, actually, learners don't need to know this, the rest of us, Behind the hood, it tracks data, XAPI data on all those interactions, um, including things from YouTube and PDFs and stuff like that, right? which is pretty awesome. You can write some custom code. Find yourself a software developer, right? Give them the specification and, and have them write some code. And I tried that out. I brought a software developer in off the street a few years ago. Um, and I just said, hey, here's, here's what I want. And I want it to use this data specification. And you know what his response was? All right, whatever. It's not hard. It's pretty straightforward stuff. And actually, they appreciate not having to come up with a data model themselves, right? There's already a running start for this. And then you can import from business data. If you can't get your business data to send you directly to XAPI, which is ultimately where you want to go, right? But even in the meantime, if you can get batch files, format that as XAPI, and then load that in, your learning record store, you have then the benefit of the business data in the same spot as your learning data, right? So five ways to send your data, one of which requires you to spend absolutely zero money because you all and zero effort because you already have it, right? Your e-learning authoring tools. So let's take a look at these e-learning authoring tools. Right? The most important thing about this slide is the red or the text in the red bar at the top. I know this is incomplete because this list is constantly growing and it's super exciting, right? Um, because there are more and more vendors coming out all the time. If you know of a vendor who sends XAPI data, go ahead, let me know, and I will add them here. Out of the box, out of the box, most of these are going to send stuff that looks like SCORM, okay? So it's basically going to be that same vocabulary of data expressed in a sentence that is pretty much going to be the same sentence over and over again you're just reading it in a different language okay so there isn't a lot of high value in the out of the box data that you get from most of these packages i will tell you domino um, and lectora both do a much better job of sending really rich xapi data with you not having to lift a finger Smart Builder allows you to assemble with zero code the 
data that you're going to be putting in there. Right. Um, and so you don't need code. You can get whatever you want, but you do have to assemble it. It actually looks like a little Lego brick. It's pretty awesome. Okay. So those three are going to be out of the box. The rest, um, it's either easy or difficult, depending on the package. Right. But you are able to get um, if you're able to get to the JavaScript triggers within the authoring package, which I know for a fact, Captivate and Articulate make pretty easy to do. If you can get to those JavaScript triggers. Okay. Then you can send, right? If you write in those that that code, you can send XAPI data on almost anything within a course. That's pretty powerful, right? As long as you know JavaScript. For bonus points, right? If you can get a course to send both XAPI data and SCORM data, so make your old LMS happy and make your new learning record store happy with all, and you happy with all the fun data, um, you can do both. Domino out of the box will do a hybrid publish. Most of the other packages uh, require um, more or less uh, magic behind the scenes to make that happen, but it's not impossible. Um, it's also completely possible to send XAPI data to multiple LRSs at the same time. So if you want to dig in a little bit more on authoring tools and really, really grok this one, um, there was an article last spring um, that uh, Paul Schneider and Robert Penn did. It's built on the work that has been uh, every few years updated, which is really exciting, um, starting with Sean Putnam around um, how do out of the box the authoring packages handle XAPI data. And uh, Paul and Robert look at, um, I think six different packages, it's really awesome. Uh, Zappily is a tool that my team created to help people who use Storyline, Articulate Storyline. Currently we're actually adding functionality for other authoring packages and other XAPI experiences. But Zappily writes the code for you. So think of Zappily kind of like Google Translate um, or any kind of wizard or calculator, right? So I put in, this is right my e-learning course, right, or my experience. I'm already logged into my experience, so it knows who I am. I pick a verb. I pick an object. I pick the context that I want to add to my statement, right? I'm a, I kind of craft those building bricks together. Zappily then makes the code. I then copy and paste my code into Storyline at Rock and Roll. I copy and paste my story, my code into a button or into the header tag of a page. And next thing you know, I've got XAPI data from all sorts of things that weren't sending great XAPI data, but I didn't have to code it. Okay? I'll let you know a secret. Myself, I, I have a big appreciation for XAPI. I have a big, big appreciation for software and technology, but I don't know where all the colons and brackets go. I'm not a developer. So a tool like Zappily has helped me get up and running really, really quickly. So let's take a look at what you can do, right, with e-learning. Okay. And so uh, here's a, a page. Um, SCORM doesn't even know you were here or maybe knows that I came to this page number. Right? Just straight out of the box, articulate storyline without any, I can publish it to, to XAPI or to Tin Can, but it's just going to say that I experienced this page. But look at this page, there's a lot going on. There are six things I can listen to. I can make choices. I get feedback. I can change my mind. Right? And if I'm stumped, I can click the hint button on the right hand side. Right? This took an e learning developer a good hunk of time to create. Wouldn't it be nice to know do people notice the hint? You maybe didn't even notice the hint until I told you it was there. We intentionally graded out. Was that a good idea or not? Do people actually listen to the video or to the audio clips, or are they just trying to game this as fast as they can? Click a bunch of buttons and, and move on. Right? Who goes back and changes their answer and explores what the feedback are to different statements? Okay. There's so much happening on this screen that I would otherwise miss and not be able to evaluate the design of the screen or the impact of the learning if I don't have that data. Right? Here's a drag and drop. What questions get dragged and dropped? Right? Form doesn't know. This is utter utterly unscorable, right? How would I coach Mike? So this is a sales perform, right? Sales leadership, sales coaching course, right? 
and I listen to Mike on the call and then I make, make some choices, right? How many times do people listen to the call? Do they pause and go back or do they skip, okay? After we answer this pretty straight up multiple uh, or select all that apply question, then I've got a free text entry slide screen, right? I enter in the screen, how would I coach Mike? Now, if you're in the e-learning space, we all know that this isn't scorable. Right? We can't score this. Actually, the learners don't know that, <laughs> but we can't score this, right? But with XAPI, I can tell you, right? I can tell you what everybody enters here. This was a population of only about 180 or 200 learners. That's a small enough data set. I can drop that out to a Word document for somebody and they can read it and see if people are picking up what we're putting down. If this were a biggest, bigger data set, I'd throw that into a, a text analyzer and I would look at, right, are people picking up on the themes we want them to? What is the sentiment here? You know what else I can tell here? Who just wiggles their fingers on a keyboard and types ASBF, ASBF, ASBF as fast as they possibly can to fill up the box enough to be able to move on in the course? Not only can I tell you, right, how many do that, I know exactly who did it and when, right? Those are important things, right? But it's not, right, if we get all hung up about e-learning, we're missing the big point of XAPI, which is we can get data from so many other things, right? So these are a bunch of learning experiences that use XAPI at their core, right? Um, but they're, they're not e-learning. They're something else. And whenever you are evaluating a vendor and they say, yeah, we do XAPI, your next question is, can you show me the data that you send? And do you send that data outside of your own system? So a couple of vendors goofed early on and they used XAPI, but they made it in a black box. So it, they might as well not have. Right? It's just as not interoperable. Um, as, as building their own data model, right? So the thing is you want to get that data out, right? Here's a quick, right, peek at under the hood at Zappy Apps. I can be getting all sorts of checklists and videos and observation and pathways and cool stuff and be getting XAPI data out of all of this, which is super powerful. In fact, take a look at this list, right? YouTube, Vimeo, SlideShare, Prezi, PDF. There's a pretty powerful set of things that I can do with a tool like Zappy Apps, right? But remember, it's not just things that consider themselves learning tools, right? But all sorts of things that we're using that we can be getting XAPI data from. So some people are like, great, that's a lot of data. How do I know what data to send? And I, I kind of, you know, my, 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 I, I, I want to kind of wrap my arms around that question. As instructional designers, we know what data we need. We just don't think about it very often because we've never had the opportunity to. It's kind of a learned helplessness, right? We know that we should be tracking data around all sorts of things so that we can evaluate the entire learning experience. And yet we're only able today to track at a relatively shallow level of detail about the formal learning, right? And keep in mind this formal learning box on the left side of my slide here is all instructor-led virtual classroom and e-learning formal learning. And we know we're not tracking what happens inside of an instructor-led class or a video of a virtual classroom, right? So we're, 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 we're only today tracking a very small amount of data. And you could argue with a 70, 20, 10, I know they're not real numbers, the concept itself isn't bad, right? Um, but there are all sorts of ways in which I can practice my social learning, my learning from experience, the feedback that I'm getting, my mentors, the whole nine yards that we can be tracking. We know this stuff. We just don't do it now. And I could go and it's, that's entire, and, and risk may or may not invite me for an entire other conversation around evaluation. I could totally get going on this forever. I'll show you one more though, right? If you take your Castle Kirkpatrick levels, 
I can even layer them on top of Kathy Moore's action. Kathy Moore is my hero, right? Um, and, and, and so I can be today, right? My learning management systems that do SCORM, right? Actually, my learning management systems do XAPI also. Who am I kidding? Right. But most people are in the SCORM based LMSs right now, right? You can measure your level one, your were you happy, right? Your post course analysis, right? You can get some testing data out of that too. And if you're clever and depending on the topic, you can get some sense of what kind of practice activities people are doing. But as soon as we get out to on-the-job behaviors and actual business results, we don't have training data for that. In the training space, we often don't have data for that. Right? And with SAPI, we can be getting data from across this entire spectrum. Five moments of learning need. Right? I'm just going to flash a few here, um, right? Five moments of learning need or then, because I'm not one to leave anybody else's model alone. Um, I added four more. So I have nine moments of learning opportunity, right? Every single one of these right, is an opportunity to collect data so that we can understand what's going on in the experience. We can tailor and personalize that learning experience. We can throw out what doesn't work and keep and do more of what does. Right? But until we can measure it, we have no idea. Right? So this is really, really important. All right. So we got it. Yes, Megan, we got it. We're going to send data. We're going to send data. We're going to send a lot of data. Where does that data go? Right? Let's talk about the learning record store and that ecosystem, right? This is your beaker. Okay. Your learning record store is going to be what receives stores. And when you ask for it, give back your XAPI data. You can test it for something called conformance, not compliance, conformance, which ensures that it follows the interoperability rules set out by the ADL, the Advanced Distributed Learning Group, um, and the U.S. federal government. And conformance is important. Right? And there's some nuance around that. That's for another day. And said not to be too geeky. Um, Right, but it, but but that's conformance is an important topic to know about, um, and the learning record store, LRS, is not a learning management system or LMS. We're going to talk about the difference between the two in just a bit, right? So here we go. A typical LMS. When I need to explain what does an LMS do to somebody who's not in our space, right? An LMS is where I go to find the learning is the official source of learning for a lot of organizations. It knows who my users are, who they report to, what groups they're in, right, my employees, um, or my external users, right, if I'm, I'm teaching outside the enterprise. I also can store my courses, my classes, all my stuff in there, and I can organize them into curricula and pathways. It's the official source of truth for many organizations around how, what is the, the official way that we do this? Typically, especially if you have courses and classes, enrollments and requirements and those kinds of things, if you have an LMS, you probably need an LMS. And the data around the e-learning that goes in an LMS is stored in a database inside that system of SCORM data. And then I have some way to report out about it. Now, no one would buy an LMS that only did that. Right? So most LMSs have added stuff around that core. Okay. that allow them to differentiate themselves as well as be much more useful. So this is your typical LMS today. The easiest way to adopt XAPI is to have your LMS do it for you, right? the integrated approach. And so on the integrated approach, I'm just going to go back and forth. I'm arrowing back and forth. That's the only difference is that now I'm sliding a learning record store inside. So now it has all the benefit of all those other tools it knows who my users are, who they report to, has all my courses and classes, but I'm also getting really interesting, rich data out of that. I can do this approach. I can go and grab the best of breed and attach all of these tools together and wire them up with XAPI data, sending these little data in little black lines. I can even connect multiple LMSs and multiple LRSs in this space. This takes a little bit more work, right? This is not for the faint of heart. Most people are going to start here. If you don't have the ability to get one of these, and we're going to talk about these in a moment, right? This is the approach that most people are going to take. You have your learning management system. You're not going to touch it. 
it's working for you. It's doing its thing. You're on a five year contract and you just released it last year. You're not moving it. And it takes, it's hard to move these in and out in some cases, depending on the size of your organization. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, people say, oh, I don't like my LMS. I'm like, well, how about you change it? Because I don't like changing LMS is even worse than I don't like LMS, right? So you're going to get an LRS on the side. And you're going to get your fancy learning record providers and you're going to do all your cool stuff and your sidecar LRS. And you're then going to um, pass a limited amount of data back and forth with your LMS. Right? Your LMS is not going to be able to ingest the coolness and all the rich data you're getting in your LRS, but you can maybe send over. Oh, and by the way, Mustafa actually completed something and I'm just going to send that completion over to the LMS. Great. And this allows you to get set up fast. Do it today. Grab a credit card, go do it today. Right? Get you set up fast, prove a concept, and then right, you've got a space to be operating in X API and, and you haven't had to rock the ship. If this is an utter failure, right? Sometimes your first experiments don't work out the way you wanted to. You can scrap this LRS side, start from scratch. It's very easy. You have and, and nobody needs to know. Right? So an example of this, right? We had a client. Right? that had an LMS that connected to their LRS. Their LMS did some XAPI, but wasn't fully conformant. It did not accept statements from outside the LMS, which was a problem because we had, a, this was a rich learning experience. It had a self-diagnostic, it had e-learning, it had a live classroom, virtual classroom, manager-led cohorts, a post-assessment, evaluations and survey gizmo, and a mobile performance support micro-learning tool called Flip. So what we did was we put the guidebooks and the e-learning okay, in the LMS. We put a bunch of stuff on the intranet. We just sent an email link to a survey gizmo and pushed an app to their phones. All the data from these experiences came into a learning record store. The data from just the e-learning in the virtual classroom and the live training went into the LMS. So some data was recorded in both places, but the only place to see the entire learning experience was at Learning Record Store. As soon as you have an LRS, you then have a lot of capabilities, right? I can, I can join two LMSs by having all their data dump into the LRS, right? Most large organizations end up having multiple LMSs by the time they've uh, spent any time in this space. Um, I could then hook the entire thing up to a data warehouse if I wanted to. Right? And so then I'm, I'm taking that learning data and I'm putting it in with the rest of the performance data. Right? Let's take a look at your learning record stores. Right? This is your shopping list. Uh, again, pay attention to the red bar at the top. Okay? These learning record stores right, have all been validated to be conformant, which means they do everything you expect them to do with XAPI. Okay? On top of that, then, they offer varying amount of Ease with visualizations, rules engines, data analytics, the whole nine yards, right? Um, there are some LMSs, some enterprise scale LMSs that have full XAPI LRSs that are close to or fully conformant. They do all the things you expect them to do. Okay? out of the box. This is your integrated solution. If you are shopping for an LMS, why wouldn't you shop for one that already has an LRS fully functional inside of it? Right? This is where you want to be because right, now I only have to implement one system. And if getting things through my IT team is difficult, right? I only have to get one system through that team. And this is pretty powerful. There are some LMSs that offer a varying amount of XAPI support that is significantly short of full conformance. They may not accept data from outside your LMS. They may not accept data from things that aren't e-learning or aren't sending data that looks like e-learning. They may have a hard time reporting on all that interesting data that you're putting at the ends of those nice run-on sentences that are, are your XAPI activity statements. But they do some things out of the box in a very, you know, in a limited fashion that could get you started. So if you're here right now, call them up and say, hey, I'd like the XAPI package. I'd like to be able to use that data, please. 
There are some LMSs that are actually learning record providers. So where we typically think of the LMS as the storage of data and content about training, now these are the storage of content, but you get an XAPI LRS next to them to receive the data. Not a bad thing, but don't get super excited. Woo, I'm getting XAPI. You're getting something that sends its data as XAPI. So you need two, two pieces of software with these. I'm gonna take a moment before we wrap up, right? And, and fully recognize that the last 10 minutes of 15 minutes, I've been talking about learning data and the learning data environment. And yet we've established that it's not LAPI, the learning API, it's X API, it's the experience API, right? So it's important to pause right, get our own learning ecosystem under control, but recognize that there's a whole bunch of other functions in the organization that also have data that are going to inform what we do in learning. And that's super, super important. And what's more, the promise of XAPI is that I can select key data providers from outside my organization and have that data also. So if I went to an industry conference, MTV or e-learning build or training magazine or my industry association, the American Spinal Injury Association, right? I went to a conference, Society for College and University Professionals, right? Whatever, right? That data can be interoperable and exchangeable. So I can be getting data, rich data about how I learn outside my organization. Right, and brought back inside. Then we start getting some powerful stuff. I take OSHA in one spot, shouldn't I be able to get the OSHA 40 hour reflected on my learning transcript here, so that now when somebody's doing staffing and scheduling, they know that my credentials are up to speed because it's all in one system. And that's when we get into, right, step three, do something with the data. Right? You can use it to evaluate and improve the learning experience. Right? Even before you release, as you're doing testing, you can be seeing, do people click that hint button? Do people know where to go? Are they using the stuff that we're building or should, were they doing just fine without it? I then can have these beautiful dashboards and visualizations for decision making, and that's important stuff. I can use that data then to, to, to make decisions around personalization, to make recommendations for content, and then to start right, action triggers and rules, cascading activity that happens because I did something in one system, it appears in another system, I'm either allowed or not allowed to move ahead, or other things get triggered. And that, we're, we're all very excited about analytics right now, and I am too. But the ability to put learning in the stream of performance and activity and business rules and events is really, really powerful stuff. I don't know about you. That's a lot to take in. So it's okay. The beautiful thing is this is recorded. You could go back and, and check this out again, right? Take two aspirin. Yes, this is a lot, right? This is a lot. There are ways to learn more. Uh, we'll talk about XAPI cohort in just a moment. There are lots and lots of workshops. Hands-on and geek-free is a workshop my team runs. Um, it is a fully virtual now um, workshop that we'll be releasing. Actually, the next one happens uh, August or uh, April. April, some some month that starts with A. April twentieth is um, a virtual hands-on geek-free workshop. Um, there are courses on Udemy and LinkedIn. Learning Solutions Magazine has a ton of resources uh, around XAPI, uh, learnxapi.com. And each one of the vendors that does a good job with XAPI is also doing a good job with teaching about XAPI. The cohort is a free 12-week vendor neutral uh, virtual learning by doing in teams. It is really, really cool. We run it 12 semesters every spring and fall. Um, remember, it is free. There are weekly web meetings that happen um, from two until three o'clock uh, Eastern US time. They're all recorded, so if that's not a good time for you, you can always come back. Um, 
And then in between, right, ad hoc teams form. We use Slack as our, our, our means of gathering. And people form teams and they tackle a project together. They give weekly part report out. Um, and we, there are lots and lots of people in the cohort who uh, we call it learning by lurking. They're just watching, paying attention. They'll jump in someday. It is never too late to join the cohort. In fact, right now is a super awesome time. If you go to xapicohort.com to sign up because we are starting into demos. So the XAPI cohort has been running since, um, the spring one has been running since January. And uh, we're now in the final weeks where teams are, sh are sharing their stuff. So you can see what is possible to be built for free by volunteers who didn't know each other in advance, who came together around a project and, and did that. If you have any questions or thoughts, I would love to connect up with you. So here's how to get to me. Uh, probably email is actually the best way, although um, if you want to follow along with articles and research and stuff like that, um, XAPI GNOME, uh, T Learning, or MM Torrance, you can find me on Twitter with that. I'm also on LinkedIn. There, uh, unfortunately, I have a unique enough name. There aren't a lot of Megan Torrances. So, Anne, Duncan, anybody else who's still out there listening, um, <laughs> it's been a spectacular opportunity to share this with you. And I really appreciate you inviting me to the Learning Collective. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for your time. We did have a question that I wanted to see yeah. if you wanted to entertain it. I know Duncan and Art have chimed in and, and answered, and maybe we can get your thoughts on it. OK. Oh, there's the live chat. I'm just looking at the live right now. Do I have any suggestions or IRAs for verbs and activities? Yes. Um, and so, uh, Matthias, that's a pretty, pretty, um, pretty deep down nerdy question with lots of answers. Yes. So if I am using a verb, right, my go to is I use a verb that is already established. Um, and so using the established verbs is absolutely essential for interoperability. Um, and, and the profiles. Um, the, don't worry about the links being dead, right? So, so um, IRIs are, are actually not necessarily active links. They are reference points. Um, so, um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And then the, um, so, so use a verb where it exists. Um, if you are creating new things, follow the same um, same general gist of the, the ADL verbs. And if you want to connect up with me uh, directly afterwards, I can share a few things with you um, and tips and tricks there. Great question. Sorry, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. Yes. <laughs> and here we are on how to connect with Megan. Again, uh, absolutely wonderful presentation as always. I always love watching you present because you're engaging and you're funny. <laughs> My hands are waving. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense for those of us who are perhaps not as geeky um, as you mentioned, and especially myself. And so I greatly enjoy your presentations all the time. And so we definitely appreciate your generous donation of your time today to do this session. And absolutely, we would love to have you back anytime for a different session on evaluations or um, any other topics that you want to talk about. We always love having you on. So thank you again for today. And uh, we'll continue to monitor the comments for any questions. If you're watching the replay of the video, we will make sure that Megan or someone answers your questions. But the best way, as Megan mentioned, to reach her is via email, which is here on the screen or on the Twitters at mmtorrance and then her towards learning profile as well at T learning. Thank you again. And everybody make sure that you sign up for the next cohort because you will be learning lots and lots of things and actually working on a project, which is a really great way to, to, to learn how to work with XAPI with a hands-on project. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next web session here shortly on the learning collective. All right. Thanks.